Number two then from the 2017 Advanced Higher Maths. Here we go. Four marks for partial fractions. Resolve this into partial fractions. Well, the first thing to check is, is this a proper fraction? Is the degree of the numerator less than the degree of the denominator? Because if it isn't, you have to divide it in first. Well, it is, because I've got x squared on top and x times x squared is x cubed underneath. That being the case, you can just go ahead then. Nice little linear factors. Well, x plus 1, being linear, just requires one degree less a constant on top. Then you would say x plus 2. Same again, a linear factor on top. And you think, oh, I've just got that down again there, so why not just put that down one more time? x minus 2 with a c on top. But if you did that, that would be wrong because there's no difference between those. These two fractions having the same denominator just become one fraction with the sum on top. So it's still just a constant over this, and that's not enough to multiply back up to make a cubic one. In a case like that, you've probably been told, well, just square that one then. And certainly that's fine. If you write that down, you get the mark. There is a reason for that, though, why you seem to put this down twice in that form, because other than that, you can quite legitimately say, Wait, this is a quadratic. And if I had a quadratic, that's x minus 2 squared, the term above should be one degree less linear. I'll not call it bx plus c, just, I'll just call it something else like dx plus e. So say it looked like that. You could go ahead then and just solve the whole thing for a over this and those two things over x minus 2 squared. And that would work. And you might end up with, and this isn't what you end up, but you might end up with something like this. 2x plus 1 over x minus 2 squared. However, if you left it like that, you haven't actually finished and you wouldn't get the final mark. Because that really only applies when this is an irreducible quadratic, one that doesn't factorise to integers. Because if you've got this, if you've actually got a quadratic that's factorised, this can be simplified by this little device. Notice it's x minus 2. So if the top was 2x minus 4. I'd have a common factor. And I can make the numerator into 2x minus 4 simply by adding 5. Now I can separate that. 2x minus 4 is 2 times x minus 2. That's why I chose the 4. The 5 is just a 5. Splitting them apart makes that over x squared and that over the same denominator x squared. And of course they cancel out leaving you just a constant over x minus 2 and a constant over x minus 2 squared, which is why you do that in the first place. There's no point going through this with all the extra work when the result can just be achieved by stating this result straight away. So that's why you do it. Now it's just a case of, well, strictly it's if these two parts are meant to be the same, you've got an identity, not just an equation that's true for some values of x, an identity that's true for all values of x, or rather, all values of x for which this expression is valid. Let me thornly issue that you turn a blind eye to. Well, so if this was reduced to a single fraction over this denominator, the numerator on this side would equal the numerator on that side, and that's what you do. You add this up, which effectively is the same as taking that across and multiplying. So, adding this up, I've got x plus 1, I'll need an x minus 2 squared. I've got x minus 2, I'll need that x plus 1. And I'll need another x minus 2 to build it up to the same denominator. C's got that, it only needs the x plus 1. That's the new numerator. So that should equal that numerator. And if you do that, you get a mark. B probably just say multiply it across. Now the rigorous way to do this is, if this is meant to be the same as that, then reducing this to the same form of that means you can equate corresponding terms, x squared, x constant. However, if that's an identity, it also means it's true for all values of x. So any number you put into this side should give the same result as that number being put into that side, and that's what you usually do. So you pick convenient numbers. Turning a blind eye, you say straight away, well, I could get a if I knock out that by making x is negative 1. That's quite happy with negative 1. That's not. If x is negative 1, that means you've got here. You've got negative 3, which is 9a. Knocked out, knocked out. And that then becomes 1. 
plus 6 plus 20 is 27, which means 9 into 27 gives 8 equals 3. And then, again with a brass neck, you see I'll have x equals 2 as well, thank you very much. Knocking out this one and this one, leaving me 3c is equal to, now that's time that's going to be a 4, minus a 12 plus a 20. So that's going to be a 12, so c is divided by 3, 4. Never run out of those values, which were very handy. Now you could just then go on and pick other numbers, like x equals 0 for instance, and feed it through it all. However, at this point I'm going to revert to the rigorous method, which is to say, right, I'm going to have a look at the x squared terms. I don't need to multiply it out, you can find the terms by inspection. To make x squared, I've got a on this side, there's an x squared there, and b on this side, there's an x squared. This side, the x squared term is equal to 1. So that means b will be 1 minus what the a was, which was 3. So that means b is equal to negative 2. Now there was one mark for getting two of the constants by whichever method you procured them. And the other mark is for getting the third one and just putting it back together again. So putting it back together again, you've got a was 3 over the x plus 1. b is negative. I could write plus minus, but I'd better off writing minus. 2 over x minus 2 plus 4 over the x minus 2 squared. Now you get the last mark. Just one final mention again about this little anomaly here. Nothing to worry about, you can just do this. Do this, that's fine, you'll get the answer, you'll get the marks. But here, in this initial part, this expression is only valid when x is not equal to negative 1 and when x is not equal to 2 because you can't divide by 0. And those conditions would then apply to any operations you apply to it. And since this equation here, which on its own looks very innocuous, came from this, it also comes with those provisos. It comes with the proviso that x isn't negative 1 and x isn't 2. So it's like having been handed this with some conditions. Here you go. Take this, but don't feed it after midnight and don't give it water. And so you take it and say, thank you very much. I'll do that. I'll look after it. And what's the first thing you do? You feed it after midnight and you give it water. But look, it all turned out fine. It didn't wreck the house. It didn't eat granny. We got the answers. So who's to know? But it does bother some and they won't do that. They'll stick with the rigorous method with this identity, which is to equate corresponding parts and obtain simultaneous equations. And I use that in parts when it's convenient. But what's more convenient is to use knockout values to begin with if you can. And I do that simply and pragmatically because it works.